Well, good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRNAM for Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. And our top story this morning, we're talking about Secure 2.0, the implementation, the effective dates, and questions being raised. And joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Fred Reich is a partner with Figre, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath. Fred, great to see you. Happy New Year. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. It's, it's good to be here with you. And once this is posted with, with all of the other folks. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, Fred, I, we had some really good news at the end of 2022. We've talked about it on this network. Of course, you've talked about it in your webinars and, and partnership with other organizations. We've got Secure 2.0. And I have to think that you've been knee deep or maybe neck deep in, uh, in the bill. Um, any first thoughts or initial uh, uh, thoughts about the the new bill? Yeah, you, you know, Jeffrey, it's there's a lot more there than people think about or know about, and and uh, typewritten uh, the part of the it was part of the Omnibus Appropriations Act or the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Uh, the act that big act was over four thousand pages long, typewritten. The Secure Act 2.0 was part of that, and it was over three hundred and forty pages, typewritten. Uh, with over 90 provisions. So uh, the first reaction is that there's a whole lot there, but but it's interesting when you get into it, um, most of the provisions, Jeffrey, will apply to certain plan sponsors and not to others. Uh, that's because a lot of the provisions are optional. There are some that are mandatory, but, but a lot of them are optional and plan sponsors are going to have to uh, become aware of the effective dates, like when these things actually apply and they're spread over the next seven years. Uh, and they're going to have to be consider those that might be applicable to them. Just a real quick example of what I mean so that this doesn't get too abstract, Jeffrey. Uh, there's a provision that permits plan sponsors to make matching contributions for repayment of student loans by their eligible employees. Now, not every plan sponsor is going to want to add that to their plan because maybe they don't particularly hire college graduates. Maybe it's more of a blue collar type of operation. But then there are other organizations like my law firm and other professional service organizations, uh, technology, engineering, on and on and on, that, that hire lots of college graduates. And they're going to want to adopt that provision to show that they're you know, sympathetic with the needs and issues of their employees. So that's just one example of what I mean by optional provisions that you need to understand and you need to know if it's appropriate for you and when it becomes effective. So that's an example, Jeffrey. We can get further down in the weeds. Yeah, let me let me ask you, Fred. I mean, 300, 300 plus pages, that's a lot to go through. And there are probably a lot of people, uh, plan sponsors, uh, consultants, advisors, uh, asset managers, record keepers, I mean, you name it. And, and, and by the way, individuals, consumers, trying to understand this. Uh, you and others are doing a lot of education. That's a big part. Of under you know you can't digest this in one big gulp right I mean you're going to have there's a lot that's going to go into this both legislatively regulatorily that's even a word and operationally the operations part I got but the regulatorily I'm not sure that's the right word but but there's a lot in yeah. here that, that we're going to all have to understand yeah I I think there's multiple levels of education uh, the first group. Jeffrey, is, are the investment advisors, the, the plan service providers, the groups who are actually going to either deliver the services to the plan sponsors or advise them on it. That That's the first level of education. The next level of education is for the plan sponsors themselves. Hey, these opportunities are available to you now. We've developed the systems to support them. Uh, we have the educational materials. Uh, we're ready to roll when it becomes effective, let's say January 1, 2024. Um then the third level of education is for the employees. Uh, once an employer adopts a, a so-called sidecar savings account or, or a, a, a student loan repayment matching provision, it doesn't just spring you know, to life full born. It, 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 it takes a lot of education of the employees so that they can know and understand if they want to take 
advantage of the new opportunity. So yes, there's a ton of education involved. And, and of course, Jeffrey, just to, you know, some hospital humor is the first level of education is actually people like me, the lawyers who mm-hmm. advise other folks. And but between December 29th, when the president signed it, and today, I can tell you my life has been consumed by this new legislation. It yeah. is lengthy and it is complicated. Well, we all, we all like a good novel, Fred, and this is your, your uh, I guess, your idea of a, of a good novel. Let me, let me ask you, have you been getting a lot of questions? Uh, you mentioned you've been doing, I know off camera we were talking, you've done webinars, you've already started the education. Are there themes of questions that you're, that you're hearing or seeing from clients, potential clients, or, or just people in the retirement ecosystem? Yeah, there's a, a certain amount of that is just what we're doing debating within, a, within my law firm. We have about 35 retirement plan ERISA attorneys. Uh, and some of the debating we're doing internally about uh, which clients it would advantage and, and, and so on. But, but that, that is, we're doing a lot of internal questioning, trying to make sure we really understand this on both a legal and practical level. Also, there are glitches in the bill. I mean, people think that, um, you know, that legislation is well-developed and thoughtful and all that. A lot of this came together at the end and they made, Congress made mistakes. They just flat out made mistakes. And so we're thinking about how do we advise clients where the law says one thing, but we know that they intended a different thing. And how do we get that corrected? Who, how do we communicate with Congress? How do we communicate with the IRS and so on? Uh, but yes, once we get outside of that internal part, Jeffrey, there uh, we're starting to get questions primarily from that first group I mentioned earlier, the advisors and the providers, because they know they're going to be more than us as lawyers. They're going to be talking to plan sponsors. And so the educational efforts right now are primarily at that area. Um, Let me give you an example of that also, Jeffrey. One of the new provisions is that any plan, uh, any 401k or 403b plan established after the date of enactment which is last December 29th, a couple of weeks ago, um, has to be automatically enrolled. Has to be. There are a couple of little exceptions to that, but has to be a new mandate in favor of automatic enrollment and automatic deferral increases. Except that the rule, while the rule applies to any plan established on or after December 29th, they don't have to do it until 2025. Well, a lot of people have unfortunately focused on 2025, not realizing that if a plan is set up today, it's going to have to do that. And they really ought to be thinking about uh, getting the plan, either starting it off as automatically enrolled and automatic deferral increases, or at least warning plan sponsors that that's going to happen to them. So that's an example of one of the first places where we're getting, where there is some controversy and where we're getting questions like, oh my goodness, what does that word established mean? Uh, what happens if we set up a plan in early December to become effective on January 1? Uh, is is that established in December or January? And so, yeah, we're already getting questions. They're on the, uh, on some issues like that where, where maybe there was some uh, misunderstanding or people hadn't followed the bill as it was developing, which is typical. It's only people like me usually that follow the bill as it's developing so that by the time it's signed, we have a, a pretty good idea, at least of the basics of it. So yeah, there's some traps out there. There's some things people aren't expecting. Uh, and we're trying to alert our clients to that. And they're coming to us with questions about that. Well, Fred, I need to take a very quick break. We'll pick this up on the back end. When we come back, we'll talk more to Fred about Secure. What's it mean for implementation and a lot more? You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? 
especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Tax audits, tax liens, wage garnishments. Every day we hear stories like this about good folks who are simply struggling to pay their bills. Each of them are living a frightening IRS tax nightmare and they are afraid it will destroy their lives. I'm a divorced single mom and my ex-husband left me and the kids with a lot of unpaid bills, including unpaid taxes. I was really starting to show my stress on my kids because the IRS had sent me a letter demanding a huge payment from me. I couldn't afford it. So then the IRS was threatening to garnish my wages. I'm already living paycheck to paycheck. That would have put me over the edge financially. It truly seemed hopeless, but then a friend at work told her to call the tax relief line. The people at the tax relief line, they told me about something called innocent spouse relief. They worked it out so that all of the taxes from my ex are not my problem. I don't know how that works and, and I don't care. All I care about is that I don't owe the IRS a dime and they are not going to take my paycheck. Even if it seems hopeless, you should call the number on your screen right now. There is absolutely no cost for the call or the consultation. You are under no obligation. If you are worried that the IRS could garnish your wages, seize your assets, even take your home, call us right now. The Tax Relief Line is here to help you. Now you have a knowledgeable, professional team of tax experts that are ready to negotiate with the IRS and fight for you to save you money. The Tax Relief Line's professionals have successfully negotiated thousands of cases, reducing and sometimes even eliminating the tax debt for their clients. It's very easy to get started. Simply call the number on your screen right now. You don't have to live in fear anymore. The call and the consultation are free. Welcome back. We're joined this morning by Fred Reese. She's a partner with Figre, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath. Fred, thanks so much for sticking around with us this morning. Thank you. All right, Fred, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. I just want to go over the, the, ti the timing again, because you know, as you said, the bill was signed into law on December 29th, uh, but there are some like 90 some odd provisions, 300 plus pages, things that have to be corrected from a regulatory point of view. All these provisions don't go into effect on 1-1 one, one, or didn't go into effect, I should say, looking uh, in the past, don't go, don't go into effect on January 1st, 2023. There's a staggered implementation date for, for these provisions, for many of these yes. provisions. Yeah, there are. And, and, and let me give you some examples of that. Uh, there's a provision that allows for matching contributions on repayments of student loans. That becomes effective, Jeffrey, for plan years beginning after December 31, 2023. In other words, about a year from now, January 1, 2024, that will be effective, but it's not today. Similarly, there's a provision, an optional provision for plan sponsors where uh, they can create what are called sidecar savings accounts. That is where employees who want to can defer into or can be automatically enrolled a savings account in the plan. Uh, and they can accumulate up to $2,500 of deferrals in there plus whatever they earn uh, and can withdraw when they need it. And I, I think as a result of the pandemic, you know, a realization that people don't have enough just and just plain savings. But that also is effective for plan years beginning after December 31, 2023. Uh, and so it's a year from now too. And then this mandatory enrollment provision for new plans, uh, although it applies to plans set up today, they don't have to do that until after December 31, 2024. So in my mind, I'm looking at those that are effective now, 
those that become effective in 2023, 2024 rather, and then those that become effective after that, because we're going to have to work on these with clients as they become effective. Now, having said that, if you think that sidecar savings account provision, Jeffrey, um, it's really complicated. It's going to take at least a year for the record keepers and the service providers to be able to get all the systems in place to do that, which is one of the issues. It's not, you can't just add what were 34 pages of rules in, in the bill. That's the sidecar savings account and, and have it record kept overnight. There's educational materials. There's the actual record keeping. Uh, there's educating the employees and the employers. Uh, so yes, it's good that it, actually good that it comes in over time, but it adds complexity uh, to advising clients and to plan sponsors thinking about it. But yeah, yeah, you really have to pay attention to that. I think uh, there's some good articles out there or, or that uh, talk about that are based on the deadline, the timelines, the effective dates. Uh, and if I were a plan sponsor, I would turn to my advisor or my lawyer and say, hey, uh, you know, show me an article like that and walk through the different effective dates with me so that I know what I can do, what I should do now, and what I can and should do in the future. Uh, it's complicated. It certainly is. And, and, and I think for people who have not worn the record keeping hat, uh, Fred, uh, you know, I happen to be one of the, I'm a reform record keeper, but I, but I can tell you that um, these changes are operational changes. And if you have a thousand plans on your record keeping system, you have a thousand different plans with different sets of roles, and you've got all these employees that have to work on all those plans. So there's a lot of educate operational work that has to be done, but also a lot of education. Uh, Fred, let me ask you, um, many people, uh, there was a lot of different provisions that were talked about when the bill was being worked on. And one of those provisions, for example, was CITs and 43Bs. It didn't make it um, into this particular bill, but are there certain provisions that maybe fell out that you were surprised about or might advocate, not advocate, that's not the right word, might have thought that maybe it'll be in, in another bill, maybe secure 3.0 or 4.0 or 5.0? Um, <laughs> Yeah, the the, the uh, I, I think this has exhausted Congress, uh, <laughs> you know, to to do a bill this big. Uh, so we're not going to see 3.0. Uh, maybe we'll see a draft of it, you know, the first start of talking about it over a year from now, and then it may take a couple of years after that to actually get the law that will be the equivalent of Secure Act 3.0 because uh, they're exhausted, and and now with a split Congress, they're going to be fighting a lot. And so I think we're safe for a while in terms of being able to use this time to digest this legislation, Jeffrey. But um, two provisions that surprised me. One, you mentioned the 403B provision on collective investment trusts. There, there is actually a provision that amended Section 403B of the Internal Revenue Code to allow collective investment trusts in custodial accounts in 403B plans. Um, so you would think, well, gee, we got that, but we didn't because there are separate securities laws that also apply that weren't amended. And the uh, the reason for that is that, the, as I said earlier, at the last minute, the whole bill came together and there was a lot of negotiation among the staff of the different relevant committees. But the banking committee in the Senate was not one of those committees that participated in that they control the securities laws. So, and there wasn't time at the end to run it back through the banking committee. So the provision that would have allowed from a securities law perspective, CITs to be on, on 403B custodial platforms in addition to mutual funds never got through. The securities provision never got through. So we have a, a tax code provision that says, yes, you can do it. But a securities code provision that says, no, you can't. So there we are. That may get a correction at some point in the future. Uh, another provision that really it, it pleasantly surprised me that it came through was the provision that uh, you have to automatically enroll 401k and 403b plans in the future. You know, beginning for any plan formed on or after December 29, 2022, it has to be automatically enrolled. That uh, historically, the Republicans have been against mandating automatic enrollment. That's just a historical fact. Um, but there's so much evidence now, Jeffrey, that automatic enrollment and automatic deferral increases get more people participating and get more money saved that the Republicans have acknowledged that 
and they participated in that process. Uh, now, when push comes to shove, as so often is the case, it comes down to one person, and that's Congressman uh, Charlie Neal from Massachusetts, who was a chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. He said, I want this provision in that bill, as they were doing the final negotiating. And so uh, even though it took some cooperation to get it there initially, when they did the final push, uh, as you might imagine, if there is a powerful congressman that really supports something, it's probably going to be in the bill. And it was. So for me, that was a pleasant surprise. I didn't know if they'd be able to get it past the concerns. But uh, uh, yeah, now it's only for new plans. I do think when we get to secure 4.0 or 5.0, Jeffrey, we could have uh, a general mandate that all plans have to be automatically enrolled, including old plans. Uh, I'm not promising that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that that two or three years from now, when folks are a lot more comfortable with mandated automatic enrollment, it could be expanded. So that's another possibility. And, and they're always looking at ways to improve the system. There's three big issues that they're going to be looking at, uh, Jeffrey. One is, how do they get more plan sponsors to cover plans? And we don't have time to go into that today, but there are other provisions in the bill that do that. Um, another is, how do they get people to save enough so that they have enough money to retire with financial security. Uh, so that's like automatic deferral increases. And then a third one is what happens when folks retire? You're 65 years old, you retire with your 401k or 403b account and social security, uh, and you and your spouse, if you're married, are gonna live, one of you is gonna live for 20 or 30 more years, on average 25 years for a couple age 65. Uh, and 50% will live longer than that. How do you take money coming out of a 401k plan and spread it out over 30 years? The, how are people educated on how to do it? How do they know how to invest? How do they know how much to withdraw and so on? So that's a biggie. We will see a lot more of that in the future. More and more efforts by Congress to try to create opportunities, but not mandates for financial security over the lifetime of retirees. Uh, so that's where I think we're going, Jeffrey. We're not done yet. No, we're, I mean we're still it, going down that trail. And this this is a uh, this is like uh, you know retirement industry moves at a glacial pace by comparison to maybe some other industries, um, and so it takes time to kind of catch up to where things should be. I guess my last question is where does you mentioned education, Fred, and and I know education generally. There's a Department of Education here in the United at the federal level. There's also uh, at the state level, they make a lot of decisions about education. What, where does financial literacy kind of fit into what you're talking about? So we've made all these great improvements to the system. We continue, but making sure that people understand conceptually what a sidecar savings account means. How do they pay off their credit card? How do they do the things that you're suggesting um, or others suggest? You're not the only one, but you suggest in terms of having enough money to live out your 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 lovely days in, in retirement. So how do we how do we move the needle there? There's a there's a, a whole lot of thing a lot of things that have to be done there, Jeffrey. It 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 our culture in our this country is individual responsibility. So we we and we want to stick with that, I think. It produces some pretty good results. Um, but then you say, well, we have this extraordinarily complex financial system where you have to be an actuary to know how long you're going to live and how much you're going to need, uh, you know, how to invest, how to withdraw, on and on and on. In other words, you're basically treating a 401k like a defined benefit plan, which has an actuary. Um, and the it has to start early. And, and based on the reading I've done, Jeffrey, you start with emphasizing math in grade school. That's That's really a little early to deal with financial literacy. But everything I've read says that people need to be mathematically capable to deal with financial literacy. So you start there, then in high school, you have more financial literacy training, actual classes about credit cards and savings, and maybe even entering into cable TV, cable TV contracts and other things that are difficult to read and understand. Um, and then you continue that. Uh, and I think that part of that responsibility is gonna fall on employers going forward. There's a lot of research going on right now at what employees need, uh, what their concerns are. Like employees do have a concern of running out of money in retirement, a fear, a legitimate fear, and and it is legitimate. Uh, so, and, and public policy says we don't want 80 and 85 and 90 year olds to be broke. Uh, 
So there's a lot going on there, Jeffrey. But again, I think we're midstream on that. I don't I don't think we're anywhere near the ending. So it's a whole womb to tomb educational approach. And unfortunately, there is no czar of education that covers, you know, the, all of that education and can mandate or, or even urge what I just said. So uh, school districts are going to have to take it on. States are going to have to take it on the federal government and employers. It's it's a big job. And we're only part way there. Yeah, I'd never heard womb to tomb. That's a new one. You should coin that, Fred. Fred, we're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate your insight into secure and financial literacy. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Hey, Jeffrey. Thank you. And, and thanks, everybody. And that wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to? Drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest security news and lifestyle wellness finance tech, so much more and all in one place. That's right. All in one place. Check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content? Well, visit our website and, of course, our over 300 streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRNAM. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device.